Pastor Mike here. Hey, just want to say thanks for uh, watching our YouTube channel. And uh, may God bless you with the hearing of His Word. Let's turn together tonight uh, in our Bibles to the book of James. And uh, we remember from last Wednesday evening, um, James is the half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ, the author of this book, who was, uh, again, uh, inspired by God to write the very words that we have here. And uh, we begin, um, and I want to read together tonight, verse number one, James chapter one. Look at verse number one, and then we'll read verse number two as well together. We'll see how far we get. James chapter 1, look at verse number 1 and 2. The Bible says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting, my brethren, count it all what? Joy, when ye fall into diverse temptations. And so uh, tonight, as we are going to, again, uh, James last week laid the foundation, and you remember that he begins here, James, the half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. James, the inspired author of this particular epistle, uh, simply calls himself a servant. James, a servant of God. And we remember, don't we, that we looked together in Holy Scripture as James lays this groundwork uh, last week and tonight. We remember, don't we, that the Apostle Paul began his book in the book of Romans under the inspiration, calling himself the same thing. Paul, a slave, a bondservant, a doulos of God. We also saw that Peter himself said, hey, I'm, you know, I was uh, very uh, influential in the beginning in the early church. I preached the first sermon in the early church. And he simply identifies himself as Peter, a bondservant, a servant, if you will, a slave, a doulos to the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, even from last Sunday, Brother Dean, as he was preaching in the book of Jude, we looked at that. Jude, again, calls himself nothing more than a slave, a doulos, a servant to the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, these men, brethren, clearly understood and clearly taught from that perspective. Throughout all the pages of the Holy Writ in which they were inspired to write, they understood that they were simply slaves and bondservants to the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, we looked at that one who is, if you will, in permanent, amen, in permanent relationship and servitude to another. And the reason James does that is because of the next portion of our verse that we're going to try and, again, string together and bring this together tonight, this idea of a slave and his Lord. And so tonight, let's read that together. Look at James chapter 1. Look at verse number 1 there again. James, as I said, a servant of God, and what? Of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's interesting, isn't it, that as God led James to write, he explicitly tonight, brethren, used the word Lord. Jesus, the Lord. Amen. Kyrios, that's the word that he uses there. And the word kyrios simply means supreme authority. In other words, the Lord and master of the doulos, the slave. So in other words, he lays the foundation, says, I'm a slave to Christ. Christ, then he records that Christ is his master. He is the Lord. He is the Kyrios, if you will. Now, what's so amazing to me is that this important biblical truth has been lost. And not only has it been lost, that the Christian is the slave to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Kyrios, the supreme <coughs> authority, not only has it been lost, but it's actually despised and hated by most of the Western churches today. It is an amazing thing. The Lordship of Christ, as taught in Holy Writ, listen, has been replaced by two very devilish and demonic words called easy believism. And I mean, it is an amazing thing to behold and to watch it. It really, really is. Which teaches, listen, listen, this is amazing to me. Easy believism teaches this, that you can receive Christ as Savior, Amen? And then reject him as Kyrios, as Lord. I mean, it's an amazing thing. It's as if you look in Holy Writ and you see, as one pastor put it, a divided Christ. It's like he's divided, brother, and he is not divided whatsoever. He is Lord and Savior to the true believers. Amen? Those who understand this 
teaching. It is amazing to me as the Lordship of Christ continues to be rejected through many churches, there are a couple of words that those who reject Lordship salvation do not like. One of them is repentance. Amen? I mean, again, this, this word is being attacked. It's being taken out of the preaching. It's taking, being taken out of the churches. And those who are anti-lordship refuse and say there is no repentance needed. So the question tonight we want to answer is, that's what they say. But what saith the scripture? Amen? So turn with me tonight, if you would, to the book of Acts. And I ask you tonight, even if you're a hyper-dispensationalist, amen, even if you're a hyper-dispensationalist, I asked you tonight, in the book of Acts, here in Acts chapter 2, is that not during the church age? Can I, can I ask that question? I mean, this isn't Old Testament. This is church age teaching, amen? And it starts very early on. In fact, I can take you back to the Old Testament, the book of Isaiah. You know chapter 1? God sends Isaiah, and he calls the people there in chapter 1. He says, you people are a sinful nation. He tells them they're sinners, and then you go later a little farther on in the verse there, and he tells them to cease doing this evil. Repent from this evil. And so repentance is taught over and over and over throughout Scripture. It's an amazing, stunning thing to me. And yet we have people today who teach this very dangerous doctrine, anti-lordship doctrine. You can receive Christ as Savior and not as Lord. That's sheer insanity. That's why you have so many, brethren, false converts. That's why you have so many false professions of faith. Because they do not understand this correlation between an undivided Christ. Amen? Look here at Acts chapter 2. Again, the Apostle Peter here, preaching the very first sermon of the New Testament church age. Can I say that again? And I want you to see here very carefully what he says to them. And we've read this. this is a familiar portion of Scripture to all of us. But there's a couple of things I want you to notice. Again, what was one of the words I said the anti-lordship people hate? What is it? You can just yell it out. Repentance. Okay, Repentance. They hate that. In fact, one, uh, one pastor, Jack Hiles, wrote a book, uh, The Enemies of, of Soul Winning. One of them was telling people to repent. I mean, it's an amazing, stunning thing, this guy. It's a stunning thing. But see, when you want to fill your pews and you want to have, quote-unquote, lots of, quote-unquote, professions, there is no need to teach lordship. Because you can simply make, make a profession and the guy, if he doesn't change, it's no big deal. You had one more saved, right? It's an amazing, stunning thing. Look at Acts chapter 2. Again, the very first sermon ever preached during the church age. The Bible says there in verse number 36, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the, uh, that same Jesus, whom you crucified, both what? Lord and what? Christ. But here he is, he's telling them, Peter's just right up front saying, this is the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is Kyrios. He is the supreme authority. This is what I'm telling you. Look at verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. And I don't, you know, I don't need to go into that. We've talked about that. But that word pricked there literally means to agitate violently, to pierce, to pierce thoroughly in their heart. And said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? That's a great question. We've been confronted with that kind of a, with that kind of a situation. Verse number 38, then Peter said unto them, what's that next word? Repent. 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 Anytime you see the Lordship of Christ being taught, repentance is something that comes right along with the Lordship of Christ. Again, understanding and knowing that you are simply a slave to Lord, the Kyrios, God himself, the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord and Christ, repent. Look at Acts chapter 3. Look at Acts chapter 3. Again, can I ask this question? Is this during the church age? I, th I think so. I think this is during the church age. I'm just asking. Because again, supposedly during the church age, repentance is not, is not needed. There's no need to, re to preach it. If you don't believe in the Lordship of Christ. But what does the Bible say? Isn't that what we always want to ask ourselves? I mean, what saith it? That's what you always want to ask. No matter what. Look at Acts. Look at Acts chapter 3. Look at verse number 14. But ye denied the Holy One and the just, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you, and killed the what? What's that word starts with a P? Prince. Hey, Jesus is not, and, and listen, again, rambling uh, neo-evangelicals use these kind of terms. Personal Savior. Personal Savior. Um, the Bible never calls him that. 
The Bible calls him a prince right here. Amen. Look what it says there. And killed the prince of life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And his name, uh, and his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I want that, uh, though through ignorance ye did it, as did also your rulers. But those things which God did before had showed by the mouth of all of his prophets that Christ should suffer, he has so fulfilled. What's the beginning of verse 19? What's that first word? Repent! I mean, brethren, listen, we could beat this dead horse until it's unbelievable. It is threaded throughout the pages of Holy Writ. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins might be blotted out. I mean, when you understand lordship, there's not a question whether or not you're going to repent. Because God's going to grant you repentance if you understand lordship. If you understand that he is curios, he is the supreme being. Look at Acts chapter 5. Again, just a couple of them tonight. Very, just, there, there's, there's too many of them. We, we don't have time. Again, it's Acts chapter 5 during the church age. I'm just, everybody's smiling. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. It's during the church age. Listen again to how uh, uh, the, the, uh, the Luke here, under the inspiration of God, defines the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at Acts chapter 5. Look at verse number 30. Acts 5, look at verse number 30. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a what? Prince and a Savior, for to give what? Repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are, we are his witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. Now my question is this, listen. If we understand that God, that the Lord Jesus Christ is curious, that he is the supreme authority over the slave who we are, amen. Let me ask you this. What do you do before a prince? The Bible just called him prince in two verses. A prince. What do you do before a prince, brother? I'll tell you what you do. You Generally, in a prince, someone with that kind of authority, you're down, bowing before them, in front of them, amen? Not making him your personal savior. Because when you make him your personal savior, you make him into whatever you want him to be. Not what the Bible says he is. He is the prince and savior. And you submit, brethren, to the prince, amen? This is the idea here. This is what we're trying to get through. Look at one more. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Again, the idea here um, of the Lord Jesus Christ being Kyrios and we being his servants. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Look at verse number 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Look at verse number 3. The Bible says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, listen, but Christ Jesus the what? Lord. Kyrios, that's who we preach. We preach him as Lord. We preach him as Kyrios. He's the supreme authority. He has all power, all authority over the slaves. Now listen to what Paul says in this one verse. He says, for we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your what? Servants, your doulos, your slaves. Here we have in the same passage the lordship of Christ being taught, with Paul having the understanding that he is just merely a servant, a doulos, a slave of Christ. It's amazing to me. Have you ever seen, well, do we have any farmers in here tonight, any ranchers? You ever had cattle? You ever had that kind of thing? You know what ranchers, farming, or cattle ranchers do? You ever been to a branding? You ever been to a branding, smell how nasty that is and that kind of a thing? You know why they brand their cattle? Because that way, other if they get mixed in with the other herd, those sorts of things, they'll know who the owner is of that particular animal. Amen? Many times, in the era that we're talking about here, many times, a slave was branded with the marks of their owner. And the Apostle Paul is at the very top of the list. <laughs> Turn with me, if you would, in Galatians for just a moment. Look at Galatians chapter 6. Turn with me there again. The idea of the slave, the doulos, and the Lord, 
the Kyrios being the supreme. Look at Galatians chapter 6. Let me show you this here. Again, the Apostle Paul, surely understanding what he was preaching and writing about here under the as soon as I get there, my pages are sticking together tonight. All right, Galatians chapter 6, look at verse number 17, or verse 16, we'll just start there. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be unto them, and mercy and upon the Israel of God. Look at verse 17. From henceforth let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the what? The marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul clearly taught, and he clearly understood, again, a slave who is being marked by its owner. Amen? And this is what Paul is saying. I'm a doulos, I'm a slave, and by the way, how do you know I'm a slave to Christ? I bear in my body His markings. Amen? It is a most amazing thing. In fact, I like what Charles Spurgeon had to say concerning this. He said this, I cannot conceive it possible Brother, neither can I. That's why when I hear this nonsense, this devilish nonsense of being having Jesus as your Lord or as your Savior, not as your Lord. Spurgeon says, I cannot conceive it possible for anyone truly to receive Christ as Savior and yet not receive Him as Lord. One of the first things, one of the first instincts of a redeemed soul is to fall at the feet of the Savior and gratefully and adornedly cry, Blessed Master, I'm bought with thy blood. Listen, somebody who understands that, that is the most amazing thing. He says, I am bought with thy precious blood. I own that I am thine, and thine only, Spurgeon says, thine holy, and thine forever. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? This is the mindset. This is the understanding. This is the idea that we have. And when a slave, a servant of Christ, understands that he is, he is the Lord of their life. In fact, if you look up the screen here, you could read James chapter 1, very much verse 1, like this. James, a servant, a doulos, a slave of God. He understood that. And of the Lord, Kyrios, supreme authority, master of the doulos and the slave, Jesus, Jehovah's Savior, Christ, the anointed Messiah. Think of all of that that James put in that first verse to help us to understand that as we move forward, and again, I've told you, this is why James lays the groundwork in verse number one, because brethren, listen, if you don't think that Christ is Lord, you will not submit to the 54 imperatives that he lays out for the church. You won't do it. Amen? And neither will I, unless the Spirit of God is convicting our hearts and helping us to understand how important the Lordship of Jesus Christ is. The Lord Jesus Christ is, in fact, scripturally and biblically, amen, unified as Prince, Savior, and Lord throughout all of Holy Writ. Brethren, there is no divided Christ. You can't take one without the other. It is a one unified deal together. Amen? If you got one without the other, brethren, you got the wrong Christ. You have the wrong Jesus. It isn't the same Jesus of the Scriptures. And this is what is so very important. These important doctrines taught, and, and taught throughout the pages of Holy Writ. Now, if you look back to James chapter 1, look at James chapter 1 again, back up there. We're going to go into, uh, into verse number 2. And again, all of this only makes sense, brother. It can only make sense. What he is about to address is if you believe that God is sovereign over your life. If you believe tonight, as we've prayed, amen, even as one of our dear sisters lays in the emergency room, even at this very hour, not knowing what's happening, the only way you can do that the only way you can get through this thing by the power of the Spirit of God is to believe that our Lord has sifted this through His hands and He has allowed it to pass to me. That's the only way, brother. Otherwise, you will not make it. And I want you to see what James does here. This is really important as we, uh, as we put this all together. Look at verse number 2. Look at James chapter 1, verse number 2. As he lays the groundwork, servant, doulos, he says this, my brethren, 
Count it all what? Joy. When you fall into what? Diverse temptations. <laughs> James here, under the inspiration of God, brethren, begins his dissertation to you and I, the believer, on our trials and our temptations. Now, I want you to notice in verses 2 through 12, it's very important. James first draws our attention to those temptations, those trials, in which you and I would call holy trials that are sent by God himself. So verses 2 through 12, there's two different things that he talks about. Verses 2 through 12, he is speaking specifically of those holy trials, those things that God brings and allows to come into our lives. Look at verse uh, number 12. I want you to see this. Look at James 1. Look at verse number 12. Look at the first word. What's that first word say? Blessed. He just spent the last 10 verses talking about trials, talking about godly temptations and trials that are sent our way, that God, what we would call holy trials. And then he says, Blessed is the man that, what, endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. So again, the first ten verses there prior to that, he goes through and discusses some of our trials, those, those trials and temptations that come from God, which, listen, brethren, they're designed by him to produce Christ-likeness. This is what I'm talking about. This is the holy trial. These are the holy temptations, those things that should bring out in us and produce in us and grow us to be Christ-like. On the other hand, I might say, and James says, under the inspiration of God, in verses 13 through 15, he draws our attention, brother, to some different types of trials and temptations, which we would call unholy trials or evil temptations. Look there, if you would, at verse 13. We're just gonna, I'm just going to lay this out here and kind of lay it out here, and then as we systematically go down through the verses, we'll look at each one. But I'm showing you that the first 12, brethren, are for our good that God brings, that we might produce Christ's likeness in us. Look at verse 13. Look what the Bible, look what James writes there. James chapter 1, I've got to get there. Look at verse number uh, 13. <coughs> Let no man say when he is what? Tempted. I am tempted of God. For God cannot tempt with what? Evil. You remember Father Abraham. If you go back to Genesis there, you'll see that God tempted Abraham. He tested Abraham, but not with evil. This is an entirely different kind of trial, a different kind of test that comes into our lives. Look what it says. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Listen. But every man is tempted when he, what, is drawn away of his own, what, lust and enticed. Brethren, this is a different kind of trial that comes from within, and from that's devilish, an unholy trial, if you will. Look at what he says there in verse 15. But when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth what? Sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth what? Death. And so we see this division tonight, brethren, between verses 2 through 12 and 13 through 15. Two entirely different kinds of trials and temptations. Now, it's interesting here when we look at this together. James says this in verse number 2. Let's look at that again. Look what he says. He says, My brethren... Count it all joy when you fall into what? Diverse temptations. Now let's first... <laughs> it's amazing that we can have joy when things like this come. To, to me, that is a stunning and amazing thing that, 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 that James tells us. Count it all joy, brother, when ye fall into a temptation. What we have to do tonight, brethren, is define that word joy. What does that word joy mean? There's two different joys that we see in Scripture. This one here is a biblical joy. This is the kind of joy that you and I, brethren, should be, be producing as we're going through these God-ordained, God-sent, God-given trials and temptations. Biblical joy is this. Having a calm delight. Think of this. Having a calm delight regardless of my circumstances. I know some people like that. Do you? I know some Christian people who have 
a calm delight no matter what's going on. And I have to be honest with you, this is an area that, brethren, I need to really ask the Spirit of God to help me. Because I, you can ask my wife over here. I am sick, and I am a complete, and it's sinful, brethren, worry more. Chewing the fingernails, can't sleep at night. Boy, this is happening, that's going on. I mean, these temptations and trials come. But I know some people, brethren, who are just very calm. Very just trusting in the Lord. Amen? When these things come. This is a biblical joy. This is the kind of joy we're talking about. It's having a calm delight regardless of our circumstances. Listen. Having an exceeding, listen, gladness. When was the last time, brethren, you stood up when you were going through some very deep trial and said, I'm glad I'm going through this trial. I'm happy I'm doing that. This is happening to me. Listen, that is counter to our flesh. Amen? That is antithesis to our flesh. Because generally what we do is we sulk and we whine and we dribble. Paul or uh, James says here, brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into. Listen, he doesn't say if you fall into. You get that? He doesn't just say if. He says when you fall, when ye fall into it, count it all joy. Now listen, I want us to see again this, this idea of biblical joy. Amen? Having a calm delight, irregardless of our circumstances. Look at John chapter 16. That's a great place to look tonight. To our Savior, to the Lord Jesus, who is, is God, who spoke here. Look at John chapter 16. And uh, his disciples were with him. And um, he had spoken some very hard things. And uh, they're sitting here in John 16. Look at verse number 20. Look what the Bible says. Verily, verily. Hey, anybody remember what that means? Truthfully, truthfully. Amen. I say unto you, that ye shall weep and lament. Listen, but the world shall what? Rejoice. Do you see? There is a biblical joy. There is a joy that the Christian experiences. There's also a temporary joy that the world rejoices in. It's an amazing thing to see this and to behold this. And it's, it's going to be interesting as this unfolds. Look at what it says there. Verily I say unto you that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice, and ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into what? Joy. Biblical joy. A woman. Hey, do we have any pregnant ladies in here tonight? Oh, that's right. We have several of them in here. Amen. Hey, hey ladies, look, listen to the illustration that Jesus uses here. He says this, a woman when she is in travail, labor hath what? Sorrow. I don't know, I've never had a child, but I've seen all of mine born. Well, my, you know, you know what I'm saying. Apart from the two adopted ones, I've seen them all come into the world. And uh, it was an amazing thing to behold. I always tell people this, <clears throat> and, uh, and brothers, you can relate, amen, those of us uh, who have had children. See, when the women are having the children, amen, especially if it's a long, drawn-out affair, a long, drawn-out uh, uh, labor time, something amazing happens. Because after they have the baby and all the pain is gone, something weird happens. I mean, it's an amazing thing because what happens is they forget about that pain. And then they come to the husband and go, I think we should have another one. And the husband's looking at him going, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, this is an amazing thing. This is something God gives to the women. I mean, it's, it's an amazing thing. But look at what, listen to what he says. It, because her hour is come, but as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish. For what? Joy that a man is born into the world. Look at verse 22. And ye know therefore, and, and ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again. And your heart shall rejoice. Listen. And your what? Joy no man taketh. This is what I'm talking about. This is a biblical kind of joy. This is the joy that it doesn't matter. The Lord Jesus here has just told them, I'm leaving. I've been with you for three and a half years. I've preached. You've been with me. I've ministered. I've, I've discipled you. And by the way, I'm leaving. And man, they couldn't believe what they were hearing. And he says, don't worry, don't worry because when I leave... When I'm crucified, the world will what? What did the world do? They rejoiced. 
There was much sorrow at the cross for the true believers. The world rejoiced. They were brokenhearted until he rose from the grave. Amen? But you see this temporary thing. I'm that's what I'm talking about. Young people. Young people, are you listening? Listen, if you think worldly joy has any lasting value, you're dead wrong. Just like I have to learn that. But biblical joy cannot be taken from you. No matter what the circumstance is. No matter what happens. Look at what it says there in verse 23. And in that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask, and ye shall receive, that your what? Joy may be full. This is what we're talking about. A worldly joy. A biblical joy, which is what James is talking about. There is nothing that can hinder that joy. Amen? The Holy Spirit of God, our circumstances, is controlled by a sovereign, curios, God himself. Amen? Look here at 1 Peter. Look over here. Just look at a couple of verses with me tonight again. This idea of biblical joy. I know that several of you tonight could stand up and give me the background of what's taking place when Peter is writing this letter under the inspiration of God. Anybody remember who the emperor was when Peter was writing this letter? Nero. Of course, Nero, right? And Nero loved Christians, didn't he? I mean, he, he, he loved Christians. No, no, he didn't. He hated them. He despised them. Amen. In fact, we all know what he did with them. Amen. Historically, it's very clear. So you have to keep this in mind, brethren, that when Peter's writing this, listen, the persecution and the things that were happening to the Christians around him would make you look and go, really? I mean, this is what we are supposed to have? This is what the, the Holy Spirit, the Lord God, the Lord Jesus Christ gives us? When this is going on? This is it, right here. Look at 1 Peter, if you would, chapter 1. Look at verse number 6. Look at verse number 6. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold, what? Temptations. Look at verse 7. That the trial of your, what? Faith. This is what James is trying to help us to understand, Amen. Hey, brother, in it all joy, biblical joy, when you fall into temptation. Now, Peter's saying the same thing. Hey, when there's much trial, when there's much temptation, when there's much hatred from the world, be joyful. Have that biblical joy that cannot be taken away. And he says that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than gold, that perish it, though it be tried with what? Fire. Listen. Might be found unto the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Christ. Look at verse 8. Whom having not seen, ye love, in whom though now ye see him not, yet believing ye what? Rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Here we have a man writing under the inspiration of God telling the brethren in that church, don't worry what Nero's doing. Don't pay attention to what's going on outside here because they cannot take from you your biblical joy. Listen. That's unspeakable and full of glory. When the Lord Jesus Christ is revealed, it's an amazing thing. We see this worldly joy. We see this biblical joy that is laid out in Scripture for us. Look at one more again here in Peter. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4. Just flip over there real quickly. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4. Look at verse number 12. I like how Peter starts this verse. Beloved, think it not what? Strange. See again, the Western churches, the Western culture has no idea what he's saying here. In fact, Peter says, don't think it's strange. Hey, if this thing's coming upon you, if these things are coming upon you, number one, God has, has, uh, has sovereignly allowed them to come, number one. And number two, don't think it's strange. In fact, you should think it's strange if it's not happening. This is the difference. This is the mindset that they had versus what we have. A little trial or a little temptation comes our way, and we saw, and we get, you know, we got tears running down our cheeks, which sometimes that's very uh, a legitimate thing to do. But boy, we're we're blessed beyond measure with all manner of things. Look what he says here, beloved. Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, 
which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with, what? Exceeding joy. This is again what we're talking about. The trials, the fiery trials, those things that heat up our lives, amen, are designed by God. Those are the holy trials James is talking about. They are designed by God to bring out Christ's likeness in us, to draw us to the cross, to keep us near, hovering, and cleaving to the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what they're designed to do. And often in our flesh, what do we want to do? If I could run off the stage, I'd run. Because generally that's what we want to do. Instead of embracing them as Peter did and as James does and as those Christians who were being tortured and tormented beyond anything we can imagine. He tells them, hey, blessed are you. And then look at what he, as he finishes here. If ye, verse 14, if ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. I like that. Again, joy, inexpressible and full of glory, that we would be counted worthy, amen, to be tested, to be tried, to have the fiery trials come our way because of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. If that's not happening to you, you may want to check yourself. Why is it not happening if it isn't? Happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. This is the idea, brethren. Listen, instead of destroying our faith, James begins here to lay out the groundwork. Instead of destroying our faith, brethren, trials become, and this is hard to believe, the food in which our faith feeds on. Think of that for a moment. Can I say that again? Because that's so foreign to our ears and to our minds. Instead of true biblical faith being destroyed, in all reality, the trials and the temptations that come our way, those are the things that our true faith should be feeding on. That's quite a different mindset, isn't it? Than running from what the Bible says. I want to close tonight with, uh, with one final verse. And again, the whole idea that James has laid out for us is that when we fall into diverse temptations, that we should count it all what? Joy. That we should be in exceeding gladness, irregardless of our circumstances that comes. Now, I want you to see as we close tonight how the world rejoices. James and Holy Writ tonight is teaching you and I how the kind of joy we should have, how we should rejoice in those trials. We should feed on those things. We should ask God to help us to grow, to, to do the things which are going to follow in James chapter 1, in verses 3 and 4 and 5. It's an amazing thing. So he lays that all out there. Look here at Revelation, if you would. Let me show you how the, how the world rejoices. You remember, as the Lord Jesus was heading to the cross... He was here preaching the gospel. And the last thing unregenerated men wanted to hear was the gospel. And so what happened was the religious leaders of his day, they could not wait. In fact, six trials. You remember them. I preached on them. I might do it this coming Christmas again too. Six different false, fake trials that he went through. Three with the Roman government, three with his own people. All of them trumped, all of them false and you know what they couldn't wait? They couldn't wait to get him on the cross. He's preaching the gospel. He's preaching and preaching. And they could, the world could not wait to get him on the cross. And when they got him on the cross, they what? They rejoiced. Finally, you know that, that imposter? You know that guy that said he's Christ, that he's God? Yeah, he's finally dead. Praise the Lord. That's what they were thinking. Amen. We finally got rid of another one. Until the third day. Amen, right? What an amazing thing. I want you to see the same pattern here in the book of Revelation. It's the same thing. All you got to do, brethren, I wouldn't advise this, but turn on the news once and look at the devils. Look at them protesting out there. Listen, how unbelievably wicked do you have to be to be protesting against not wanting to kill children? Are you kidding me? You've got to be kidding me. That's what these wicked devils are doing. 
It's amazing. They're rejoicing in death. God, as I told Wendy, and I think I've mentioned it, I have seriously been praying, brethren, that as you remember, right? Mordecai, I've told it, I've read it, I've read it again. Here we are getting the gallows ready, right? Haman, Haman hangs on his own gallows, the very thing that he thought Mordecai was going to be hung on. I keep praying that. God, will you hang them on their own gallows? They're so wicked. Killing babies, that is wicked stuff. But they rejoice in it, brethren. Look here in Revelation. Let me show you this. Look at Revelation chapter 11. Look at Revelation chapter 11. Look at verse... <clears throat> Let's see. We got a couple minutes. We're going to back up just a little bit. Verse 2, Revelation 11, look at verse 2. But the court which is without the temple leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city shall they tread under foot forty and two months. And I will give power unto my two what? Witnesses. You see this here? He's going to give them power. And they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. And if we had time, remember when I preached through the book of Revelation, we spent some time here on who these two are. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth, and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have the power to shut up heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood, and smite the earth with all the plagues, with all plagues as often as they will. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them, and what? Kill them. Here God raises up his two witnesses and they're standing there preaching to those wicked people. And those people hated them. They despised what they were doing as these men were preaching to them, these unregenerate dogs and devils. Look what it says. Verse 8. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city which spiritually is called Sodom in Egypt where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. Look at verse 10. You want to see how the world rejoices. This is what they do. And they that dwelt upon the earth shall what? Rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. It's an amazing thing, brethren. Here you have these two men that God has raised up to preach to this wicked generation, preaching away to them, and they hated them and they despised them. The two men are killed. The righteous men who are preaching are killed. And what does the world do? They rejoice and they give one another what? Gifts. Rejoicing in their own wickedness. It's a stunning and amazing thing to me. This is where we're at. This is literally, you turn on the news. In fact, you listen to those liberal devils talk. They can't kill you fast enough. They're writing books about killing Christians. They're writing books about killing good Christian people. Amen? And they want to rejoice. In fact, some of these feminazis who have been so taken over by the devil said they like to watch these white men squirm as they die, as we stab them and do whatever we do to them. It's a stunning, wicked thing. These wicked devils rejoice in that. Amen? The Bible tells us, doesn't it? There's another joy. A lasting, biblical joy that no one can take. You notice how temporary their joy was? Just like when the Lord Jesus rose from the dead. Look there, let's just finish that verse. Look at verse number 11. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they what? Stood up on their feet. Amen? And great fear fell upon them which saw them. Brethren, how fleeting is worldly gift giving. How fleeting do we see in that passage worldly gifts being given, these wicked people, and it's gone and over like that. 
Listen, this is what James is telling us tonight as we close. James says, my brethren, count it all joy. Amen? A biblical joy. A joy that has to do with not our circumstances, with anything that's taking place, but that joy that's unspeakable and full of glory, which the Holy Spirit of God gives to His children in those godly, holy trials and temptations that come our way, which God has specifically designed to bring out Christ's likeness in us and to transform us into the image of His dear, beloved Son. Brethren, let us have a biblical view of the Lordship of Christ. Amen? That He's Savior and Lord. That way when we understand that He's Savior and Lord, the Holy Spirit, the change that comes, we will gravitate towards and we will be joyous in our trials and temptations, knowing the good that God is sending our way. Amen? Boy, it's amazing, isn't it? When you can get your kind of your view, you know, we, like we were talking about, this is the message on Sunday. You know, having a view that's just not right. And then you just simply, you hear Scripture preached, and you just bring that view right in line with Scripture. Amen? That's what we must do. This is what these trials, James is telling the brethren, are designed to do. To make us Christ like this. Amen? All right. Anybody have any uh, questions or comments tonight before we, uh, before we close in prayer together? All right. A lot there, isn't there? We're not done with verse 2 yet, but there's a lot there. Verses 1 and 2 are packed full of unbelievable importance as the letter then unfolds before <coughs> us. The Lord Christ, He is our curios. We, brethren, are doulos slaves to a wonderful and mighty supreme authority, God Himself. Amen? All right, well, let's pray together tonight then. Father, we again thank you for the holy writ that we've heard tonight. And Lord, there are many things that I'm sure could have been said better. Maybe some things, Lord, that um, were left unsaid. But Lord, there's a lot of deep doctrine here. A lot of important truth that comes from the book of James. And may we never consider it unuseful. And Father, as we see your Lordship on display, as we understand who we are, so thankful, as Spurgeon said, so thankful and so grateful. All we can say is, Great Master, I know that I've been bought with thine blood alone. I am thine only forever. Master, what can I do? Father, that must be the attitude that we have. Understanding again that the Holy Writ clearly describes, and as Paul wrote under the inspiration in 1 Corinthians, you were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Father, uh, we're thankful for the gift of salvation. We're thankful tonight for the price that you pay, that only you could do. And then you would be so gracious to your sheep to call them out of darkness into light. As we're going to see not too far along here, the Father of lights. There is no darkness in you. You are perfect and pure and holy and good. All the things that you do are good. All the things that you do are right. Everything is perfect. And Father, we thank you for that tonight. Lord, we think again of our brethren tonight who are going through the very thing we're talking about tonight. Some who just recently, today, they've had a holy trial come upon them that has been sifted right through the very sovereign hands of God. And Father, tonight we pray for our brethren who are suffering. Father, that they might look at this as a gift of God that will produce in them more Christ-likeness. Knowing that you are sovereign. And Lord, I know that's easy to say, 
much harder to grasp and get a hold of. And Father, may the Spirit of God richly dwell in our hearts that we might rejoice in these things. Lord, again, we love you and so thankful and grateful for all those who are here tonight. Father, thank you for them. And Father, for those who are watching and those who, will, Lord willing, will be watching later. Father, may your word sink deep down into all of our hearts tonight. May we have a biblical view of the trials and the temptations that come our way. Father, we love you and ask and pray all these things in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. It is an amazing thing.